fresh delight, thy pure beaming radiance give. Come, thou Father of the poor, come with treasures which endure, come, thou light of all that live. Thou of all consolers best, thou the soul's delightsome guest, dost refreshing peace bestow. Thou in toil art comfort sweet, pleasant coolness in the heat, solace in the midst of woe. Light immortal, light divine, visit thou these hearts of thine, and our inmost being fill. If thou take thy grace away, nothing pure in man will stay, all his good is turned to dread. Heal our wounds, our strength renew. On our dryness, pour thy dew. Wash the stains of guilt away. Bend the stubborn heart and will. Melt the frozen, warm and chill. Guide the steps that go astray. Thou on those who evermore Thee confess and thee adore. In thy sevenfold gifts assist. Give them comfort when they die. Give them life with thee on high. Give them joys that never end. <clears throat> All right, so in view of our final exam, we're going to have another class. Woo! Because I, I would just hate to, you know, settle, right, for something less. We're actually thinking of our branding for SJI. And one of the things that's coming out in the marketing is we're gonna like make the the uh, the word uh, the, the the advertising kind of gimmick thing. Why settle? Why settle? Never settle. Don't settle. That's gonna so why settle, right? So let's just do an exam. Waste of time. Let's focus in here. I'd like to do this as a summary, but I want to push it further with you with a question: What makes an artist okay so if we were to go beyond description it could describe different artistic types of people artists are picky artists are mean artists are dramatic artists are weird okay that's like not the point <laughs> philosophically what's at the basis of their weirdness <laughs> We might be here for a while. Uh, an example, we just saw that video by Bad English, When I See You Smile, Bad English. Why are they always wearing long hair? Why do they always look so funny? You can almost pick an artist out of a crowd because they'll have like some sort of exorbitant scarf that's like four times wider than any other scarf. You know, a flash of color. You know, and you say, well, why is that? And philosophically, you can actually analyze it. Because if you want, you could take it's the question of the human person, the artistic person. And the analysis starts by saying, well, the, the artistic person manifests themselves in and through their actions. Okay, so it's their actions that are different. So what's different about it of the way that an artist acts? The way an artist acts. So that word acts is a little bit a uh, little bit too too broad. The way an artist lives. Okay? And by that, right, we mean thinks and loves. Because those are the foundation of everything else. So how does an artist what makes the way an artist think or love unique? Well, if I if I analyze this, because what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to do an analysis. So an analysis is not description, it's actually bedrock truth. So to get the bedrock truth, you have to drill down through lots of examples, and you distill it down till you finally get ah this basis that you're like yeah that's absolutely true that's more so it's like a, a journey of abstraction. So I start with what makes an artist, and then I start well it's a person who acts, but action actually is going to be found in thought and love. You see, so actually we're making progress. As you're demonstrating this. Uh, so if I were to do this vertically. I want you to, because I want you to grasp that philosophy is not just people making stuff up. It's actually an objective truth. It's a science. Uh, so the question was, what makes an artist? 
And it said that's a question of a person. And that the, the person, in order to understand the person, you have to understand action. In order to understand action, you have to understand thought and will. So, uh, like, you're like, yeah, that's, this is true, 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 oh, wow. Now I'm finding an objective way of answering that question when makes an artist. I'm going to look at how an artist thinks and how an artist will. Well, you could say, well, what makes that different from any other person? So, that's because there's a, um, the order of thought and will. So, if I were to put thought in, in a more classic uh, way of speaking, you would say intellection. So it's more precise to say intellection. The operation of the intellect. But since that's too much for our brief little course, thought and will. You say, well, what is will? Right. Will, we're going to say, is my, uh, my uh, attraction to the good. Every single human being does this differently. And yet all of us do this. Get in touch with, I'll give you an example. Father Francis, Therese, and I are absolute opposites in the way that we approach a problem. In a way. Cracks me up. Cracks me up. I, I approach a problem from the air. And I'm like, on a kite. And I'm like, all right, there's a problem there, a problem there, a problem there, a problem there. There's many types of problems. Now, which one is the way that I should approach it? Should I spend time here? Let's see if I first, uh, I have time on this one. Let me engage. Okay. Father Francis Therese, <laughs> on the contrary, approaches problems from the ground. So he's not going to see that there's five or six. He's going to look at the one and understand it and see whether or not he's going to engage in it. So when I say, um, Father, would you take care of Eunice during her stay? His immediate question, I know what it's going to be. He's going to go, what's involved with you? <laughs> and I'm in my kind of like, if I told you what was involved in Eunice, I would be taking care of it myself. So this, is, this is like, I would be wasting my time because now I've asked you to solve the problem. Well, I'm not going to solve the problem until I know what's in it. See? And I'm like, well, I'm not going to tell you what's in it because then I'm solving the problem. <laughs> exact opposites. It's very interesting. You all have an approach, each one of us. Some of you think, for example, by a feeling. You start with a feeling. You, and then from that feeling, you, you decide if it's good or bad. And then after you decide if it's good or bad, then you try to analyze it. Wouldn't that analyzing be before deciding if it's good or bad? If you think that way. Okay. But a lot of people don't. Okay. They just walk around and they feel and they're like, good or bad. And it's just a feeling. Like, I'm pleased by this or I'm not. And if they're not pleased by it, you'll never make them think about it. Other people operate on, uh, on intuition. I'm very intuitive in my thought. Intuition. I see things as a whole... And I just feel with my brain where to go. That's how I am. So an intuitive thinker has, has flashes of genius. You're just like, where did he get all that? And it's because he's just flashing through. But <laughs> it's a bit problematic because then if you're like, wait, explain how you got there. And I'm like, well, didn't you see it? It's obvious how I got there. I can't, I can't tell you how I got there, but I got there. I got there, boom, you know. This is, this is a very frustrating. So intuitive people make great speakers and very difficult, like, collaborators. Because you're like, what, like, can you bring me along here? And I'm like, that's so laborious. <laughs> Are you serious? Walking you through the process? Uh... And if you actually give me too much process, then I actually die. My intuition dies. I, I just, like, I'm, I'm worthless. I'm just like, it's a process. So this is not, like, there's nothing to this. Just follow the process. Where's other So an intuitive person will see the whole... He's, he's a person who grasps the whole, 
and then through the hole sees the parts. So, whereas a feeling person is, is dominated by like their emotions, an intuitive person has this kind of relationship to the whole. Uh, another way people think would be through a process. This would be something like a logic. The logic determines the outcome. And each one of these, so a, a lot, this type of person, yeah, it's kind of weird like when we talk with them. This would be like someone who's like an accountant or a computer kind of person. They, they actually, you, you feel like you don't really care what's real. What's real almost, it, of course they care about it, but they never really get to it. It's kind of like, well, just uh, give me the process and we'll make this thing happen. Like if, if this, then this, if this, then this. If A, then B, then B, then C, then C, then D. And I'll just give me data and I'll process it through. So it's very good to have these type of people on teams, but it can also be a bit, a bit, you know, cumbersome because they're never generative of anything new. That's not a bad thing. Intuitives are generative of everything new all the time and have no basis on, like, you know, connection with others. There's pluses and minuses. <clears throat> what I'm trying to give you are these examples is, you know, then this is what you write books about and make millions of dollars. Because then you're like, I found the five brain ways, you know. And I found this through, uh, you know, research. And then you write a little book about brain way number one, brain way number six. This is true. There's all these different ways. And then each one of us has a link in that brain way with the will. And a feeling person, this will is very strong. So I think with my brain, or I, I think with my heart. I mean, what a blessing that is, right? People that's like, they just, they see the dog, and they love the dog, and they're one with the dog, and they're just holding the dog. I mean, it's beautiful. And then if you're like, what is the dog? They're immediately like, I love dogs. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's kind of cool. They're thinking with their heart. I didn't say if you love dogs, but that's what they'll say, because their thought pattern is one with their love. Well, that's, that gives you a lot of compassion. It gives you a lot of insight. It gives you a lot of meaning, a world full of meaning. Yeah. Uh, and that's because their will, their attraction to the good is very close to their thought. And you got down here in process, folks, where the attraction of the will is like very divorced from, a divorce from, from thought. It's like, what, why would you bother, bother me with what you, what you love? Their thought can be very cold. So this one over here... It's that they love with their brain. <laughs> and sometimes you meet people like that. <laughs> You're just like, how did you ever like get married? Like, <laughs> it even seems kind of funny. And then they, you, know, you see their wedding pictures. You're like, wow, like there's a whole different side to them. You're smiling. And, like, <laughs> like, you know, everyone is different. And this, of course, has a lot of advantages, too. Because this person here is not going to be swayed by all kinds of... It's hard to manipulate somebody like this, isn't it? You know? And it's, it's so nice because they're constant. It's, just not, it's not one or the other. It's to show that when we talk about thinking, we talk about loving, we talk about it in a myriad of ways. Okay, so, so, does that make that point? Okay, talk about myriad ways. So now what I want to say is, what's the way that artists tend to have in common. Is it possible to speak about a globalization, but a type of distinction that we notice with most artists? I think it is. Because if I were to say, ah, they're artistic, we'd all smile and know what they know what we mean. There's something that we notice we have in common that they have in common in the way that they <coughs> approach Reality, and I think it's fascinating to finish the class by talking about that a little bit and asking why. So I'm going to start with some of the descriptors. An artist is a unique, focuses on things that are unique. Remember, like uh, when we went to that artist studio? I mean, it was bizarre. Every one of them was totally different, and you almost felt like they wanted it that way. You know, it was like paint the door the way you want to. You can do anything you want with that wall. Unique. They all had their own style. It wasn't just unique, because then it was unique in their way. 
so that in it, there's like a crafting of a style of life, and it would it would inhabit perhaps the way they dress, the way that they move their hands when they talk, the way that their voice follows their hands. It all depends on how artistic they are. But when you meet them, sometimes you meet people who are coherently a style. They're like their own branding, and almost the the stronger that they're in touch with that. Uh, it, like that, that redounds to the way that they then do their art. Their art kind of looks like the way that they sound. So, this is descript descriptions: unique, style, panache. Terrific word. It, it means what it sounds like. Panache. They all have it. It's that splash of life. A boring artist is not an artist. It's like he, your art can't be boring. I should be like, there's a type of novelty, of discovery. No one has ever done this before. No one has ever said this before. You know, in, in the prayer, for example, that we're reading, this this translation, I love, I love, I love, I love, because it's been done by my favorite poet. This is Gerard Manley Hopkins, which I consider, and many consider, the master of English poetry. But look at how he does that. Uh, come, thou father of the poor, come with presence which endure, come, thou light of all that live. And you're like, wow, that's absolutely amazing, the rhythm. It's called sprung rhythm, where he wanted to make the rhythm to mirror natural speech, but he's formalized it. Into this thing where the meaning hits you, it's it's syncopated. Come, and then you expect it to be come da 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 da, da. but instead it's come thou, <laughs> come thou light of all that live, come thou father of the poor. You're like, uh, uh, uh. and that's so cool to be jerked around on purpose by him, because when you allow yourself to be jerked around by that, the meaning becomes even more clearer. Come thou. Father of the poor, come thou light of all that live. It makes it so much more majestic. That's if you appreciate poetry. But there's a novelty there. You're like, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's never been done before. This is the difference between if I drew something and a painter drew something. You're like, that's nothing to that. If the painter did it, you're like, wow. So there's someone in an artist where they always seem to be pushing the limits. We've all accepted what the wall should look like. And then the artist is like, no, I won't accept what that wall looks like. I've got to do something to it. There's a pragmatism and a practicality. I would almost say a materiality to an artistic person. They're, they're sensitive to the way that things sound. Right, Father Francis Torres even went and ordered special voice medicine because he can't stand my hearing my voice. He can't. It hurts him to hear my voice. Uh, that's the sign of an artist. No one else really cares. But to an artist, clutter in a room, death. Right? Or oh my stupid gosh, the bottom of that books. galaxy gallery that we were in. Yeah. There was like too much. Too much. Yeah, you're sensitive to the world around you, but you're focused on this practicality. It's kind of cool. Sometimes with artists, it all depends on who they are, but sometimes it's like we've talked too much. Let's do something. Let's paint. Let's sculpt. Let's dance. I remember working with a, a professional dancer, and she'd actually take time out of her day to just be alone in a room moving with no one watching her. So she was dancing alone with no one watching her. And she said, I have to do this <laughs> because I just need to feel in my body. I have to be in my body, you know. And so she's like literally like just in this space, feeling the space. This is what she would do. She would go up to it and then, you know, like do all these like weird things because like she's, she's inhabiting it. And that's how she would, that's from that place that she would be a creator. It's amazing because we need that. But look at how practical and material it is. Look at how physical it is. Of course, it's spiritual. 
But the genius about art is that at the same time as you have that in an artist, you have a transcendency, a type of fascination with the mystical, with the other. It's the haunting of chasing after beauty, which, remember with St. Thomas Aquinas, has the, the dimensions of Integrity, uh, symmetry, and claritas, which we have to say in Latin because there's no other way to say it. Claritas, shimmer and shine, if you're a poet. And I've got no poets in this class, so all my poeticness is lost on you. Claritas. The, the, a thing that sh the, the radiance of a thing see then that word claritas for Aquinas is the key to beauty beauty he says it it's kind of like explodes upon the eye it's the sound of Eminem's voice that pops you're like oh man that's a perf that's, there's a perfection the feel I'm using all the senses if you haven't the feel of a fender on a car that's just right, that kind of like arc on the engine of a motorcycle. If you want to just touch it like this, that's absolutely perfect. The smooth taste <clears throat> of that beer, which has totally balanced all the different things and then comes out afterwards to embrace you with the, the humors of the oak. You're just like, how did they time that? To say, oh. And see, if there's like a, an explosion there, you're like, there's, that, that's perfect. And we will pay Ten times more for that one ounce of difference. Uh, when you drink scotch, it's like, it's the same stuff. But it's totally not the same stuff. And to have that, that explosion in the taste, you'll end up dropping $500 instead of $100. <laughs> and to even get close to it, you drop $100 instead of $10. You got these levels of scotch. Because of that claritas. So depending on where you're at, an artist will be fascinated with this. And that's what I mean by the transcendent, the mystical. There's like they're searching for something that you that you it's like a Zach, again, I'm trying to find all the different senses. Zach looking for the, the views in the mountains. You find that spot where you're like, I've sacrificed to stand here. The very fact that I'm standing here has all the value and all the meaning. Uh, I just, you know, watched a, a movie about K2, and the climbers on K2. One quarter of every, of all the climbers have died. One out of every four people who try to climb the mountain have died on the mountain. And when you get to the top, you can only stay there for 15 minutes. It's cost you $300,000. It's taken two months of your life. It may have killed you, and most of the ones who have died have died on the way down. So you're about to die. But for those 15 minutes at the top of K2, <laughs> Clary does. It's, it's, and what they say, they say, I'm standing on the limits of the world. It's where the earth stops. There's no more earth. And the next thing is the heavens. Just to be there for 15 minutes is so glorious. That they sacrifice all that for. Or like the guy in the squirrel suit. Can't get life insurance, they said, because he's going to die. And they said, why do you do it? And he answered, dude, like, I fly. Like, I fly. <laughs> Claritas. Something about that. Okay, so this is like a description. What we can see, if we go beyond that description, though, is that what this has in common is that it's an intelligence of the <clears throat> spiritual, the meaningful, within the material, the practical. And that word within is what makes you an artist. 
every human being has to see the spiritual within the material. If I didn't speak to you, you wouldn't hear what I'm saying. If you didn't hear it, you wouldn't know it. All, all of life has it that the intelligence, the intellectual, is found inside, to use an image, trying to use every brain cell that we can here, inside the sensible. It's just the nature of things. In order to know what chocolate tastes like, you have to taste it. But then once you've tasted it, you're like, no, I know chocolate. Like, what do you mean you know chocolate? Yeah, I tasted it, so I know it. If I didn't taste it, I wouldn't know it. But I can know it from the outside by looking at it. I can know it by weighing it. I can know it by touching it. I can know it by smelling it. But until I've tasted it, there's something I don't know about it. Right? Well, that's because I find that intellectual within the sensible. But then what we do for, for the normal person is that once you've done that, the sensible fades away because, I mean, like you can't taste chocolate forever. But the intellectual remains. I still know what it is. I have a grasp of chocolate that stays with me. And this is a noble thing. What the artist wants to do as a person, though, is to never leave that sensible. To actually make it so that you journey in two directions. On the one hand, through the sensible to the intellectual. And then, <laughs> once you're there, just to see that that intellectual is so impermeated into the sensible that the two are, it's like radiant. I can almost see glory when I see that painting. So what is glory? It's the look on in the eyes of that person. I want to, uh, the artist, this within, he wants to embody, to encapsulate, to, to, um, to entrap the ethereal, since I'm a poet I couldn't resist, he wants, to, he wants to do all of this. He wants to all truth inside the physical world. That is genius. Because it means that I have to know two things super, super well. The truth and the physical world. If you want to know what clay is, talk to the potter, not the geologist. <laughs> yeah. Geologists love the old clay like Joker. The guy who works in it, he loves the clay, knows the clay, smells the clay, feels the clay. And he could never say it into words, but he could make clay do things that a geologist could never make it do. A race car driver, he's able to push the matter further than you'd even know. Because by his intelligence, he becomes one with the race car. And he makes that thing drive. I mean, if you even think of an athlete with their body, uh, like we, we learn more about the body by the people who choose to inhabit it and make the body everything that they are about themselves. And they're able to push the body, do things with the body that no one has ever done before. We didn't even know it was capable of. You guys see what I'm talking about? When you say like they That's know an artist. Physical, the physical world and truth, do you mean like their version of truth? Like as an athlete, like if you want to say that an artist, but they might not be working towards any truth except for like this image of the perfect body or something that they think that they need in art. Yeah. Uh, it's a truth about, uh, that's not like a conceptual truth. It's like a what things are. So let, let's take this, this bottle sitting here on the table. It is there. It, you might not think it looks like much. I actually think it's really cool right now. The solitude that by a bottle on the table, the light that's inside of it. There's a lot visually that's very rich in that right there. Uh, but at the same time, like, you see, my, but if I was like, that's not just a bottle on a table. As an artist, I'm going to see that that bottle on the table is actually connect, is connected to me. The grasp, the truth of an art for an artist, this 
intelligence of the spiritual meaningful within the material, the spiritual meaningful for an artist is, is really connected to the finality, the purpose, the will of the artist. That's what makes them over here so passionate. Why it's so hard to live with an artist? <laughs> because they they get upset about everything. Everything is a drama in their life. You know, it's ridiculous. And why? It's because they aren't just thinking water. They're feeling the water. And if I was to make this universal to you, I would. You, you want to just not see a picture of this. You want to see a picture that expresses a truth to you about who you are why you are, and what this water means. And that's where the artist comes in. They're able to see that ordinary thing. Like, I don't know if I could take a picture that would do that, but if I hired a photographer, I would expect a picture of that water that made that water express something bigger than the water on a table. So that maybe they would reshape it. Maybe they would put it in a different place. they get an angle. They would light it up from the inside. And they would make this like life. So here's an example. If I were to look at that, what is this? This is actually my whole life. If I don't have this, I die. This is survival. Water on a table is a symbol of my continuation of my existence. Now if I have that, that then I'm like, how do I express that? But I don't want to just express it by saying this is a continuation of his existence. I want you to see in this right now Father Nathan's continuation of his whole existence. So I'm going to try to illuminate it. Maybe I would do that by putting sand all around it and skulls. And then I would illuminate this from the inside with like a, a green kind of light. you know. And maybe I would get him to pose behind it so that his face is reflected in the water. And then when you see the same thing, you're seeing a symbol. Bree thinks that's a terrible idea. Yeah, that's because she's an artist. <laughs> see, like, why, no one else cares, but Bree's like, oh, you can't do it that way. I know, she's like, no, we're doing it this way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's because Bree wants to embody, encapsulate, and entrap that truth in the physical world. As she feels it. It's a case in point. It's pretty cool. If you're not an artist, you really don't even really, you're just like, what? I mean, like, whatever. <laughs> but the more that you're an artist, the more that you're intelligence, you're like, that's a betrayal of that physicality. There's almost like a type of like, um, of like a type of uh, sacredness of the physical. They, they, you, they love color. They, they love rhythm. There's something in there where they, they see more than physicality. They, they see humanity. And then artists will be able to not just feel that, but be able to show you it. So when, um, I don't know, does anyone have any examples in their life where you've experienced the power of art to do that? Where have you seen or experienced someone who's come to you and made the ordinary seem extraordinary? <clears throat> it's just like any um, any blogger or whatever that um, like there are a lot of these young mom, blogging moms that, like, make their ordinary, like, house or whatever look immaculate, and they glorify the, um, the ordinary, I guess, like, with their kids or, um, and how they photograph it, how they speak about it, um, I don't know. You love to make, like, ordinary, like, I mean, like, that bubble of water. Like, not that example specifically, but, like, on the trail, like, like there's a rock, and you were like, okay. yeah, look at that rock. <laughs> um, 
Okay. Yeah, then, yeah, I'm glad because you're right. So, like, they're, um, with the blogging example, like, taking a photo of their kid um, in the sink, like, bathing in the sink or whatever. Like, it's, it's kind of that timeless um, connectedness, I guess, with, like, their family or ancestors or their mom or whoever and so they make like something totally ordinary like much more meaningful because of how it's photographed, where it is, what it is. You know, it's not just I mean it's an everyday thing or whatever. It's a normal activity, I guess. Um, but because of tiny details. I'm just I'm kind of looking for the other three here. <clears throat> Have you ever been struck by a piece of art? Maybe never. I'm just if you never have, just say never, and then I'll stop bothering you. I only see like when people take pictures of like landscape or like beautiful view of the ocean and the mountains. Just the way they take it, the angle, the lighting, just looks amazing. Uh huh. I was negatively struck by a piece of art <laughs> that um, I saw a picture of an artist that um, had made a spoon, but instead of a, a spoon like we would normally think of, it was covered with fur. And just even seeing the picture of it, just it was sort of repulsive because if you think about like hair in your mouth in the fur, it's just... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they probably did that on purpose. Right. <laughs> just hearing that wakes what, me out. <laughs> that's what the professor said, that that was the point of it. Yeah. Where, Vincenzo, are you... Where are you sensitive to things that are... Where are you sensitive to beauty? Where do you look for beauty? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Lots of places. I hope, every time I see the moon, I have to stop and look at it. We were just talking about that last night. The moon, like, I don't know. I don't really notice it ever because it's just the moon. It's like All right, let's do it this way. Where is Vincenzo sensitive to beauty? I say... Yeah, do it that way. That's better. Well, one, yeah, I want you're, you very, to see. you're very stylish. Like, you're sensitive to, like, what you wear. I was thinking the same thing. Um, and taste. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I take that back. If it's beer, you're sensitive to it. Mm. Yeah. I think mm. in um, how you express yourself, how you present yourself in, like, your style, I'd mm. say you're very sensitive to. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, like, dress? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but also your hair is always, like, nice. Mm -hmm. You present yourself well, even the way that you sit your posture, your presentation of how you speak to people. I think that you're sensitive to, to like uh, making sure that the other person receives and is not offended by who you are. So anyway, I'm just pointing that out because like everyone's different, but I'm pretty sure everyone's got some sensitivity. You're like for me, space. I'm very sensitive to space. If you if you decorate a room well. Like, I'll actually gasp when I come into it. And then I'll just be happy just because of what it is. So, like, I already know what I want my classroom to look like next year. I've already picked it out in my brain. And I'm going to be really upset because I'm not going to be able to get that. Because I'm not going to have the money. Or because a certain group of other thinkers are going to, like, insist that they have their way. And I'm already upset about that. And then we're, all depends on where your artistry is. But the thing I want you to, to grasp and all of this kind of dancing around the picture that we're painting here is this. You see and you insist on the unity between the spiritual and material. This allows for two things to happen. So the artist, in other words, is, he's not someone who's like, don't you see? This is, you know, like, let's now close our eyes and think about these thoughts. No, 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 no. They want you to taste their thoughts. They want you to, to move their th your thoughts. That's, it's, it's like there's the sacredness of the material. And they, they don't want to be apart from it. They want you to, to bathe in that color, uh, 
to, to, to feel the moment that they have for you because the truth is within it, not outside of it. They create symbols. They're people of the symbol. That, that, that makes two things happen. On the one hand, glory. And, and, the, and, and glory us. Their life is lived out loud, even from a furry spoon, right? Like, look at how tangible that is. It's in your face. You can't get away from it. It's like, ah, uh, you know? And they love that. See, it's that physicality. They're looking for that. Well, when it's done in the correct way and not in a negative stupidity of modern criticism, you actually are living with people who embody glory. Something awesome about a well-dressed man. It's just awesome about it. Especially then, you know, works at that and nails it so that when you're in his presence you're like whoa um, think of just something like silly the, a military guy in uniform you know and it's like the, your shoes have to be polished and the crease has to be here and why? because it's for the image but when you have that image you're like there's nothing greater on earth than a man in uniform it's just like whoa and it's supposed to be it's the idea and you get in these kind of crazier uniforms, like, you know, the French with their little peacock thing and everything. <laughs> it's like, you know, a woman in her wedding dress. It's like, and then she'll spend months preparing her body for that one moment of when she puts that dress on. And the tan is just right. Then she spends four hours on her hair, $700. And then all of her fairy princesses come over three hours before the wedding. And they're clothing her piece by piece. <laughs> And, and you're like, what? And yet nobody would take that away from her. Because it's actually a gift for us all. Because that moment, then they time it so that the back doors of the church, you open them first. And then you bring the girl into it. And that way from the altar, the bridegroom sees it all. She's just a shadow in the light. And then she emerges from the light down the thing. You're just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and they time it with music that's just simply glorious. And everyone stands and people cry. <laughs> Art. <laughs> and more than that, people think of heaven. And they think of themselves. And they realize that the 23 years they spent raising that child were worth it. And their lives come together. <laughs> 26 years. <laughs> Okay. The artist is going to be a person of that glory. That's like, uh, even, you know, with like we went to the choir performance. It's like, what was Father Francis listening to? We all thought it was pretty, I liked it or not. He wasn't listening to the, the melodies and stuff. He was listening to the way that it was done. That grasped something that was more than that music. That was our whole search for meaning. And that they made present there because they did it amazingly. Like a well-finished phrase. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, oh, <laughs> people that are like me. I like hearing the women. <laughs> and on the other hand, you get drama. Now, we, we, we laugh because of the personal drama of these passionate, unique people that are... But the drama is even more intense. Remember, artists kill themselves. <laughs> Why do artists kill themselves? <laughs> the drama is because art is only evocative of truth and goodness. It evokes, but it doesn't deliver. If any of you have ever seen the Pieta, when we go to Rome, we'll see the Pieta together. By the way, SJI students go to Rome, all expenses paid. <laughs> I'm just letting you know in case you're thinking of what school to go to. Just that sign on this dotted line. <laughs> At the end of their first year, we take a pilgrimage to Rome. The Pieta is Michelangelo's statue where Mary's holding Jesus. You've seen pictures of it, but when you see it, depends on how sensitive you are to that particular idiom. But for me, I've spent an hour on my knees just watching it, looking at it. 
bonding with it, feeling it. Because it's such a mastery. Cool. It's just like, it's the perfection.